so uh, everyone is just um, um i just take this opportunity to welcome adrian and um, he is at a, a southern queensland university and he's a open education practice manager but we also have different relationship because we both are um, one of the leaders in a special interest group that is run by something, some society called Askelite. So Adrian is leading um, the open education special interest group and I lead learning design special interest group. So uh, that's why we have other kind of collegial relationship as well. Uh, and uh, so last year also I have invited him to, and it was super interesting. So I just thought this year also we will do that. So. Welcome, Adrian, um, and um, thank you for sparing time and, and apologies about the last week that nobody turned up and all that happened. So <laughs> my very sincere apologies. So um, yeah, I would um, I'd like to just acknowledge traditional owners of the land where we meet and study. And I pay my uh, respect to past, present and emerging and whoever Aboriginal origin people who will be watching this at a later stage. So over to you, Adrian. Thanks very much, Kashmira. And um, I would like to start as well by acknowledging the traditional landowners upon whose land I work and study and live. And as we go through tonight, you're going to see that one of the reasons why I feel very strongly about this is that open education is very much about building upon and building with and acknowledging um, work that was done beforehand. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that the very first learners, teachers, the very first researchers in Australia were the First Nations people of Australia. And um, so I think it's very important to acknowledge that as we start with open education tonight. Now, Kashmir mentioned beforehand that I work for the University of Southern Queensland. There, I'm the manager of open educational practices, and those words will hopefully mean a lot more to you by the time that we finish tonight. As we go through tonight, there's going to be a couple of times where we pause to reflect. I'm going to ask some questions as well. If you feel comfortable, feel free to answer via voice, or if you are not as comfortable with that, feel free to answer via text as well. But um, there's there's a, a cunning plan for why I do that. One, it gives me a chance to get to know you a little bit better and to tailor the presentation as we go through a little bit better to the audience, but also it gives me a chance to rest my voice for a moment um, and to grab a quick drink. Uh, but as well as that, listening to me for an hour straight falls under what I call cruel and unusual. So taking a break from my voice is always a, a welcome thing as well. So as we go through, just by means of introduction, um, I mentioned my position and uh, where I currently work. I am a confirmed PhD candidate with the University of Tasmania where my research um, is uh, focused on the lived experience of people working with open educational resources in Australian higher education. Um, prior to this, I've been a, well, I still am a librarian, a learning technologist, an online learning designer, and an open culture advocate, and I collect obscure words. They may or may not come up later on. And as Kashmir mentioned, I am one of the co-conveners for the Ascolite Australasian Open Educational Practice Special Interest Group. So moving on from there, I see open as everyone's business. This is something that no matter where you work in education, no matter at what level or in what part of, let's say, for example, in my context in the university, open is something that you should know about. And I use this analogy in my presentations of the migrating Canadian geese, because um, I don't know how much you, you know about them, but when they migrate, they go into a V formation. Now, the goose at the very front, the leader, is the one who has to really do a lot of work. And they're the ones that create a slipstream and the other um, geese uh, have an, a slightly easier time traveling in that direction. However, it's very tiring work. So every now and again, 
a new member of the flock comes forward and takes the leadership position. And I see the same thing happening in education where sometimes you want a learning designer to be that person in the front leading everybody else. Sometimes it's a librarian. Sometimes it's a member of the graphic design team or a videographer or an audiographer. Um, sometimes it's a member of the academic staff. There's a whole range of people who are not only part of the flock, but also can take the, up that leadership position. So that's something that, that I like to stress, um, that it is everyone's business. Now, with open education, we tend to be concerned with well, what I call the big questions, and we're going to do a couple of those tonight. We're also interested in the freedoms associated with education and open licensing systems, as we'll find as we go through, provide us with a lot of freedom uh, in the manner in which we teach and learn. Interested in things like emerging pedagogies, barriers, and also economies, because increasingly there is a focus that education is seen very much in, in sort of neoliberalist capitalist terms, that there has to be a return on investment, those sorts of things. And education can often be viewed in very outdated economies as well. And this is just to name a few areas. So it is a fascinating area to be involved with. Now, my first question whenever I start off um, these sessions is, why are we here? For those of you in the audience um, tonight, what I'd like you to consider is, why are you studying at the moment? What is the purpose that you have of being involved in education in some way? Why are you getting involved in education? I imagine that for, for, for I imagine it's not because the fame, fortune, and glory that awaits you. Uh, so there's got to be another reason that's going to sustain you. And I'll give you a moment to think about that. And uh, if if you if you do feel like sharing, please uh, either do so in the text or unmute yourself, please. I'd love to hear from you. Are you, is, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> Certainly, Joy. I feel like, well, besides the fact that I, I really was just due for a change of career, but like it's it feels like a responsibility to be able to share like a view of history, especially um, being educated in, in that time when we, as an Australian student in the 80s, where we didn't really learn much about um, Indigenous history or not correctly. So it feels like a responsibility to A, learn that stuff um, and teach it. And also like to teach how to be like quite discerning. So like, it's almost like a social justice contribution for, for me, it feels like that, which I, I, can, I can hardly even articulate it because it's kind of a new idea. <laughs> that's that's brilliant. I, I really like that idea. And I think that um, I don't know how this resonates with you, but I, I always feel that um, being educated or at least being in the um, in the realm of helping others to become educated. And that's that's a term that we could spend the next hour unpacking all by itself. But at least being involved in education is part of helping people become uh, more involved in a participatory democracy. If we're going to exercise democratic rights properly, we need to build that on critical perspectives. And I think that education plays, I'm not sure if I'm even on the right track here. Yeah, you are, that really resonates um, with me as well. Um, being able to articulate, I think my political views and um, as I, it just feels more and more critical, um, might be an age related thing, or it might just be like where, what, I, what I'm noticing now. Um, and, yeah, I'm being able to, to, to see through the, the volume of information out there. So it'll be interesting to what you've got to say about open education as well. Absolutely. Did anyone else want to share their thoughts as to as to why they're here? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, yes. So 
I originally started with a different career and 10 years later, like this whole time, I feel like I've been working towards becoming a teacher just from that. Um, I even remember with my brothers when they were little, I would be with a chalkboard and like writing and I feel like that's just like instilled in me that I want to help others um, and want to um, help all students be successful no matter what their path is and see the the positives in them um yeah so that's my little my little thing absolutely and i think i think what you've touched on there is something that open education values very highly which is being um as accessible as possible being as inclusive as possible um and within educate within open education we tend to articulate it as being that um everyone has a right to access education it's in fact one of the united nations statements about you know, the human condition is that everyone has the right to access education. And they note in their sustainability goals that the way in which we build a sustainable future, the way in which we build a global community is through education, which if you ever have a chance to look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for the world, one of them is education. There's a whole range of interconnected ones as well. So, for example, the, the connection between education and poverty, for example, is, is very strong. Um, is that the kind of stuff that, that, um, that aligns with what you were just mentioning? Yeah, yeah, definitely giving, like making sure that everyone has that. Um, specifically, yeah, working with those that maybe aren't seen as um, model students or, you know, behaviours and things like that. I really love being able to get in there and tick and find how they work or why why that's come through. So having that access to all yeah, students. So that connects really well. Excellent. That's great. That's great. So I'll go. So sorry, I, I just yes, please jump in. say that because I am in the audience as well. So I think uh, I think part of uh, uh, me choosing being uh, a teacher is that from the very, very childhood, I, I only thought that if I could ever do things, then it could be only like three things. So either I am like an astronaut or doing like something in astronomy or something, uh, or like scientist, or that I will be in uh, military uh, fighting for my nation. And, um, or I could be a teacher. So that's all that I, I had because my, my father was professor and my, my whole family is in teaching. So I tried the rest of the two, and, and because uh, uh, my like physics was my priority, so I, I tried uh, going in astronomy and I published as well. And, but I didn't get into that research uh, uh, group where I wanted to and got depressed. And that's a long story short, I came back and joined army. And, uh, and then uh, I was in ordinance. That means I look after the weapons. And uh, I was among first women um, uh, commissioned officer in, in Indian Army. But as I got through training, I realized that uh, I couldn't sleep nights over night just because that I could not, uh, you know, be convinced or convince myself that I could ever hit anyone whom I have nothing to do with. So uh, after a lot of introspection, I ran away and then took up my last one. And ever since then, I am a teacher. But I think that it is also in uh, Maslow hierarchy where uh, you go through like your basic needs and, and then go. If you are a teacher, your um, need of self-esteem is, is readily satisfied because you think that you are making a difference in somebody's life. And that is, enormous satisfaction. And uh, one of the assignments that these students do uh, for an information attain is that at the part of that is that they uh, talk about their teaching philosophy, what drives their teaching. And I recently marked that assignment and I, I read all a whole lot of stories about how, what drives their teaching and everybody has their own. So that was very interesting as well. Excellent. And one of the things that, that um, whenever you get a large group of open practitioners together, there'll often be a discussion around, well, 
why why are you involved in, in in this or you know people are very forthcoming you know i became involved because and a lot of it is ideological in nature uh, so um did anybody else want to share any thoughts um at the moment sorry colin already responded in the chat uh, oh okay yeah. could you could you just read that out yeah, um please kashmira yeah it says uh uh i'm gonna uh good it held it. what is it that's the name of the place i hope and internet here is very bad in uh, cutting in and out so i'm studying now and i want to be a teacher for a lot of reason for my first nations mob obviously just uh brainstorming quickly i i want to give the children adult and families i work with the hope inspiration and to be a role model for them excellent uh and inspire them and uh, to make a positive impact on first national people in education sector. I get great deal of joy from that too. Yeah. Fantastic. That's amazing to hear Colleen. And when, when I hear people who say, uh, who talk about inspiration and bringing joy and, and giving aspiration to people as well, um, that's, uh, it's, those are the kinds of feelings that um, that I can definitely connect with that um, there are days when really good things happen and you feel as though you have made a difference and um, and and you'll actually say to yourself this is why I come to work this is why I work in education yeah and so I can definitely see uh, I can definitely hopefully see where you're coming from as well Uh, you are muted at the moment, so I, I can't hear you. There we go. So <clears throat> I'm on Groot Island. It's a um, little island about 80 k's uh, east of, of the Northern Territory mainland. And our internet here is really bad at this time of the day. Like it's bad all day, every day. But as the sun goes down and we, we drop out of reception, so I can piece together what everyone is saying. And I thought I might just quickly type because it might be if I if you can't hear me, at least I've sent um, the message. But yeah, I get a great joy. Get I'm 50 years old and I'm studying. It's a little bit late, but it's better late than never. I've been in education for 20 years doing lots of different roles and I feel now that I'm ready uh, to study to be a teacher but um, I get a great joy out of it and it, what's, it, what motivates me and wakes me up every day um, to see engaging and uh, feeling the love of the children. I don't know the children, I'm not from Groot Island but I'm Aboriginal from the mainland of Northern Territory and I'm just so excited to be here at the moment and studying. That's excellent, and you are correct. Never too late to be studying. Um, I've I've had a number of I've had a number of students that I've interacted with over the years, who um, I knew one gentleman who was doing his PhD, and he was he he had just turned eighty when he uh, when he graduated um, his PhD. So you're never too old to start. So I'm going to wrap the. I'm going to keep those in mind as we go through um, tonight, and um, as I explain how, how open education manifests, and also hopefully things that you can take away from this as well. Now um, I have talked a little bit about where I come from in terms of my beliefs around education, and this is really one of the main uh, ones that shaped my thinking, which is a policy statement from 1988 um, from um, the Dawkins uh, white paper. And it basically says that the, the, the point of the university is to gather and preserve knowledge to promote greater understanding of culture often at odds with majority attitudes, I love that bit, and in doing so, supporting the development of a more just and tolerant society. And I think that it's not just universities that do that. I think that it is every type of education that contributes, and I really do like that, supporting the development of a more just and tolerant society.
Also I mentioned to you about the um, UN sustainability goals, and this is just part of the statement around the policy brief. Um, and I've left the, uh, the link in there so that when I share the um, slides with you after the session, you'll be able to go through and click on these links if you are interested and follow them through. But um, again, this is talking about things as not just about the individual, but about what it does for society and indeed what it does for a global community. Now, let's get to actually what open is. Now, I, I, I like using these two quotes because they're distinctly coming at it from different ends of, of the spectrum here, and they are both true about open. So firstly, Winston Churchill stated that all good things are simple and many of them are expressed in a single word. However, then we get to Jung who says, well, perhaps it sounds very simple, but the simple things are often the most difficult. And uh, open education definitely fills both of those. Now, what it really means is that we're trying to move towards a form of education, especially when we talk about educational resources, that means that anyone can freely access use, modify, and share for any purpose. Subject at most to requires requirements that preserve the provenance and openness. In other words, materials and experiences that are accessible by all, and where we say the requirements to pre preserve provenance, this is what we call attribution. So when you use something that is openly licensed, something that it is from the open education realm. It is free to use, free to modify, free to share, provided that you acknowledge where you got it from. So it's that basic idea of giving respect for where the information came from. Now, it is about freedoms and it is never a neutral activity. And this is something which, which is something that I've dwelt on a lot more over the last few years, because what open does is it starts to question who has power. It starts to question who has the authority to share information, to create information, um, and who has the ability to access information. So it becomes a very pointed activity and it's evolving. So the chances are, if I gave this um, uh, presentation in a year's time, I would give a slightly different approach or I would add things to it. And we also have, we also have within um, open education, we have a, a, a couple of uh, statements that we use when we see that people are using the term open, but not really actually delivering on it. And so some of those are the Canadians are to, uh, coined the term FOPEN, um, which is a portmanteau of the, the French word faux, meaning false, uh, so that it rhymes with open. So you get false open essentially, and open washing, which we repurposed from the people who, uh, for example, with environmental activism, you have companies that say that they are green, but in fact they are not. And uh, so they they get accused of being green washed or green washing. We use open washing. So those are two terms that you may come across in this. Now, when I talk about freedoms, there are five freedoms that we associate with open licensed content, and they are the uh, ability to retain. So if I find something that is openly licensed, I can take a copy of it and I can keep it on my local computer and that's uh, completely legal within the framework. I can reuse it. So I can take it, I can use it as it is, um, so let's say, for example, if it's a lesson plan or if it's an image or um, if it's a textbook that is openly licensed, I can take this and I can use it. I can redistribute so I can share this content with other people. No barriers to access. I can revise it. Um, so this means that with open content, and um, something that I have worked on beforehand is taking material that was produced in the US. It has a very particular context because it refers to their experiences, their educational systems, which may not work perfectly when you're using it for teaching and learning in Australia. And so legally, I'm able to uh, revise that 
for an Australian context. Again, I'm acknowledging where I got it from though. And remix is the fifth one. So I can actually take a range of open material and I can bring all of them together to create something brand new. And all of this is made possible by a licensing system that we call Creative Commons. And you can certainly look that up um, and, and get more information about it. But what Creative Commons does is it gives creators of material the ability to state up front that they are interested in sharing. So it says you are free to, and it will say what you're allowed to do with the item. And then it says provided that you, and then it will state your obligations. And the really good thing about Creative Commons licenses is that there's three, three um, layers. So the first layer is what they call the human readable code. And this is, um, this is the ability to um, state it in plain English so that you could explain this to somebody on the street and they will most likely understand it. It's very straightforward. You then have machine readable code, um, which is then what you would use if you were um, in, importing it into a website or a learning management system. There's a bit of coding. Um, and then the third one, proving that they are neither humans nor machines, we have lawyer readable code. Um, and lawyer readable code is the, is the really dense material where people, um, in, mo in most countries, including Australia, have done some really fantastic and really hard work to bring this into our legal system so that it sits alongside things like copyright. And we wouldn't be where we are today if those folk, um, those legal professionals had not actually done that work. So these licenses are the backbone of everything that we do. The other thing, uh, and I'll show you some examples of some, some open content a bit later on as well. The other thing that it looks at is what we call, um, or uh, a, a research by the name of Martin Weller, who works for the Open University in the UK, coined the term pedagogy of abundance. Now, he argues that a lot of the way in which we go about education is actually about scarcity. And it was true decades and decades ago, it was definitely true that in order to access this knowledge, um, the best way to do it was from the lecturers. The lecturers were a finite resource. You had to come to university in order to hear from the lecturers. University libraries tended to be well funded. And so they, they were kind of a, a concentration of learning resources. And again, if a book was borrowed, it's off the shelf. One person can use it at a time. This notion of scarcity was all the way through, the, through especially how the university worked. However, post-internet, we're now living in um, a time of abundance. Being able to access content even though it comes with certain difficulties and certain inequalities is certainly less scarce than it was say 30 years ago. And so if we are to take the notion that, well, information and content is abundant rather than scarce, this potentially changes the model of education. And so what I would say then is just something to, to reflect on at the moment, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, is that if content is something that is very abundant, that absolutely anyone can get, and sometimes I've taken a look at university courses and when I wanna shake things up, I will say to people, I can replicate your content with an internet connection and a library card. If I can replicate your content, then what is the value for people who are coming into this course? What's the value for people who actually interact with the university? And so my question for you is that if we were to embrace a pedagogy of abundance, so the idea that all of this is out there, people can take it, what's your role in formal education? What is it that you are bringing them to the classroom? Is that a question you want us to ask? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Yes, jump in, please, Joy. I, I, it is, it's just really quite overwhelming. And it reminds me of a, a subject I did last semester um, 
uh, was like on um, was a lot of it was based on Kenneth Goldsmith stuff, which he wrote um, a book called Wasting Time on the Internet and Uncreative Writing. Um, have you heard of him? He's it's amazing. I'll have to he's write a, him down. Uh, he's he's a, he's very well known apparently. Um, he's a bit of a rock star, but he was he was saying similar stuff like there is there is nothing like made us think really differently about creativity and you know that there is nothing is kind of new under the sun so the answer to that question must be somewhere along the lines of like how how that information which is abundant and everywhere is uh whittled down and reorganized maybe So there is a there is a notion within education of curating content, and so if you are the the discipline specialist or the teacher or whatever term you would like, being able to help students to look at this abundance and really bring it down and say, okay, the core of it is this, or you know there are three major arguments. Here are examples from all three. Um, schools of thought. These are the kinds of skills, absolutely, that are, that, that are absolutely essential. So curating content, certainly. Did anyone else have, have some thoughts on, on their, their value? Um, for me, I wrote down delivery in the way that it's delivered because, you know, teenagers, well, that's the field that I'm going to, but teenagers, they could have all the information in the world, but processing it could be um, quite tricky by themselves or overwhelming. Um, and building relationships with young people and being able to role model behaviours and things like that. Um, but yeah, relationships is a big one for me. And I think sometimes that needs to come first before the actual education delivery part, um, in my personal opinion. I couldn't agree more. It is it is really about that connection. And there's, there is a school of thought which says that if you ask people about and and this is something perhaps for you to think about as well is that um when you talk to people about their their primary school experience or their secondary school experience or or, or studying for a degree no one is going to turn around to you and say you know what the most awesome thing about university was it was that seventh edition chemistry textbook that that made it for me no one's going to say that I, I, I actually I really hope no one would say that what they're going to say is there was this teacher there was this lecturer there was a librarian there was some human being who I interacted with and because of that I got whatever fill in the blank essentially it is the people that we remember not the resources Okay, no one's going to remember seventh edition chemistry, um, unless it is with a slight shudder of horror, maybe. Um, sorry, you can tell that, that I do very poorly at science and maths. I, I kind of skated through at best. Um, they are not my fortes. I'm far more in the humanities. But you get, you kind of get the idea that, um, that this role in formal education, people come first. And you find that open education is very people centered because we, we think a lot about who are the people who are engaging with education. Um, and also a lot of the, the open ed um, ideas are centered around, well, how do people get access to this? How do we remove the barriers to this and those sorts of things? And indeed, when we look at open knowledge structures, there's um, we try to make sure that there is low or no barriers to access. So I talked about before beforehand that open educational content is usually free to access, free to download. You remember that retain, free to download. And so, for example, there is a network that, um, that our university is part of, which is called the Open Education Network, and they run the Open Textbook Library. Now, the Open Textbook Library is growing all the time. At the moment, they've got about 1,100 textbooks at the university level, written by lecturers, peer reviewed, and for a lot of them, they are rated on the site according to a very strict rubric. That's 1,100 textbooks which are completely free to download, completely free 
for somebody to set as a textbook. And we're starting to get people at the university embracing this idea because instead of saying to a student, your success in this course is dependent on being able to afford a $200 textbook. Because if you don't have the textbook, you're probably not going to do well in the course. So rather than saying a $200 textbook, they're saying the textbook for this course is free. And that's shaking things up significantly. In fact, when we talk about when we talk about um, students um, and what they do and don't access, one of the things I do at the beginning of every semester is at our campuses, I have a whiteboard up and the whiteboard says, what were you expected to spend on textbooks this semester? What did you actually spend on textbooks this semester? And if you didn't actually have to spend money on textbooks, what would you have spent it on? I'll tell you now those first two, what were you expected to spend it on? What did you actually spend? Those numbers never match. Okay, I get lots of students writing on that board. And then I look at the what would you have spent the money on if you hadn't bought textbooks? I've never had anyone write anything silly up there. It's groceries, fuel, travel, rent, internet, one person and probably this is the one that I hammer home every single time I give a presentation to, to lecturers. A few people wrote up their medication. And I said, here we are in an environment where we are trying to empower people's lives. And the barrier of a textbook, people are actually saying, if I hadn't bought my textbook, I would have bought medication. That's a really horrifying, sobering thought. I have a couple more of those later on. Also about shared ownership and power. Okay, so in the classroom, students can use Creative Commons licenses. Students can be creating material in order to help other students. And in fact, we are seeing preliminary research coming out of the United States. There are um, piece of assessment being used in higher ed where students not only do the assignment, but then they'll do a reflective piece which says, now that you've done this assignment, if you had to help one of your peers to do this assignment, what is the best piece of advice that you would give them and what strategy are you going to give them to help them to succeed? And those are all gathered together and they actually, admittedly, you go through, you mark them, you make sure that they're of a particular quality. Once you've got those quality contributions, those become a little booklet that goes with the assessment for next semester. And they've actually found that when students use content created by other students, their marks actually go up compared to students who only use material created by the lecturer. Um, and so knowing that another student has written this with the intent for you to succeed, or from their experience of doing it. Those are the kinds of things where we say, well, students as co-creators of knowledge. And again, it goes back to what I said about questioning models of power and questioning really who has the authority, um, who can create knowledge. I mentioned the legal mechanisms around uh, creative commons. Also being able to focus on context. When you've got material that you can change, and also involve students in those changes, you can actually get much richer conversations. I had a lecturer that I worked with a few years ago. She teaches international business and she had been using the course content. She'd only just been put into the course. So she had all the course content from the previous um, semester and was revising as she was going. During a class, there was a case study that, had, uh, that was talking about a Malaysian business. And up in the back of the classroom, there's a group of students who were talking amongst themselves and shaking their heads a lot and, and the like. And she said, oh, well, hang on. You know, are you joining the rest of the class? What's the discussion about those sorts of things? Turns out those students uh, were from Malaysia and they actually said to her, this is all wrong. Everything in this case study, this is not how things work in our country. Now, at that point, she turned around and said, oh, OK, well, I'm interested in revising the course material, making sure that it is accurate. How would we change this so that it did reflect? And the students actually took that part of the tutorial then and taught the other students. And then they helped to construct the case study, which was much more reflective of their local culture.
And so when you've got those kinds of things happening, you're really empowering people to share their stories and share their voice as well. Now, there's a, a, a range of assumptions um, and I think we've, we've covered a lot of these because they are really about who's allowed to share with whom, who's permitted to create knowledge, and what are really the roles of the teacher and the students. And if you do want to reflect on your own teaching practice, your own teaching philosophy, I would highly recommend that you come back here, take a look through some of these questions. I use these questions when I'm doing um, academic induction. So when we have new lecturers who have joined the university, we have a session once every semester for all the new staff. And um, we talk about things like teaching philosophy, where they sit, those kinds of things. And a lot of these are the kinds of questions that, that we lead discussions with with them. So the, the question is then, and this is something for you to consider as, as we move through the remainder of this, is that if you did have access to free and open learning resources or could create them or could co-create them, would it impact your teaching? And I'd like you to keep that in the back of your head as we go through taking a look at this in a little bit more depth. So I mentioned beforehand about the, re, the, the open abundant and also non-rivalrous resources. Now with non-rivalrous as part of open, it means that, say for example, this presentation, I have a Creative Commons license on it. Now, if I um, give it to you, if I give these slides to you, I don't actually lose anything from that. It's an abundant resource. It's a non-rivalrous resource. Yeah. My words are not working. It's a non-rivalrous resource which means that if I share it, what I have is not diminished. And in fact, the Creative Commons slogan used globally is when we share, everyone wins. And this is becoming more and more important. Now, within your own areas, within schools, I'm sure that you would have seen very similar figures, uh, perhaps even worse figures than these. But some of the things that drive my practice when we consider the human-centered nature of this is when we look at the experience of homelessness uh, in university students, the number of students who will skip at least one meal per week, uh, one meal per day, those who struggle financially, those who say that the financial pressures of the university will actually impact their mental health, and those who withdraw, those who are unable to complete. And also students who state that sometimes due to hunger, they can't focus in class or forced to withdraw from a course because they couldn't afford to travel to a placement. Those are the sorts of things that become really sobering and is one of the reasons why we are as people centric as we are. And even last week, there was a uh, uh, there was an article in The Guardian around soaring rents and insufficient support for for university students. And indeed, yesterday there was a uh, an article around Brisbane universities who are now starting to sell some of their student accommodation um, to developers and the like, which is further making this a massive problem. So again, that human centered idea of these we're thinking about the people who are trying to access um, education and the difficulties and challenges that they have in doing so. So when we, what, when you think about, are you going to be able to engage in open, whether or not it's to, to bring materials into your classroom or perhaps to create your own materials, a lot of it is um, about what you already have and do, only different. So when you need content for your classroom, you're going to need to go looking for it anyway. So it's what you already have and do, only different. You look in different places, and I've got some links to those places that you can explore after the presentation. Um, when you get a chance to write something up yourself, if you think that it could be useful to other people, you, know, you might photocopy it, you might email it around, you might share it with a colleague already. Well, with Creative Commons licensing, you might consider, well, maybe my sharing goes beyond my immediate context, my immediate colleagues. So what you are already doing, only different. 
And indeed, there was a, um, a piece in the conversation last year uh, in October, an entire article around why all Australian schools need teaching material banks. And I, I remember I, I read through that article just thinking, well, awareness of these kinds of approaches is not high in Australia. And articles like this are, are definitely evidence of it, where they were talking about, well, if only we had a common pool of resources, if only I could see what my colleagues were doing, if only there was a mechanism where I could share my content with my colleagues or get my colleagues to maybe even review what I'm doing so I had somebody else looking at my content. All of the things that were mentioned in this article are things that open education is capable of achieving. And so I, when we talk about integrating openness with your existing work, I've got a couple of tips on, on how you can do that. So firstly, you might consider that um, adapting, okay, so taking a resource that already exists and modifying it. That may save you time adopting a resource whole cloth so if it actually suits and we all have our own internal criteria for what makes quality learning and teaching resources or whether or not we author something to begin with now I've got an example of um, most of my examples are textbooks because that's one of the key areas that I support at the university but we have both of these books which is well-being in educational contexts and opening eyes onto inclusion and diversity uh, both of these are completely free and they have an open license. We've got the links to them down in the bottom in case that you're interested. And at least in Queensland, a number of schools have started engaging with the authors in order to build wellbeing plans for not just their students, but also their staff. And they have spoken about how powerful it is to have access to this kind of content that they can download, that they can read, that they can share with other people. And indeed, with the Wellbeing and Educational Contexts uh, book, what we have done is run a series of workshops with staff from a range of uh, secondary schools, mostly. And what we do is we use a tool which is called Hypothesis, where the teachers can actually um, log in, they go into the book, and they can use an annotation tool to go through the content either by themselves or in groups, and they can enhance the content. They can provide examples of materials. They can rewrite case studies. Uh, they can provide a commentary. And so literally the authors have had a couple of hundred sets of eyes go over this book. And right now they're in the process of sifting through all of that information, distilling everything that people have told them from their actual experience in schools, and they're refining this text. There is no other way that you would really get two, 300 sets of eyes over a book with everyone contributing. And this has been part of their workshops that, that actually assist people to build these well-being plans. Um, and so the school is getting something out of it. The authors are getting something out of it. And then on top of that, the book, when it's shared, is much better. When we share, everyone wins. So feel free to take a look at these books as well. The, this one here um, is um, a, an example of where we took a textbook now, this was an American textbook, okay, and um, our lecturers in anatomy and physiology uh, took it and they built upon it, they changed it, they did a whole range of things with it. It took about 10 months worth of work, this text, it's, it's huge, uh, but it's being embedded into a range of courses now and is the first Australian edition. Now, in this book, we, of course, acknowledge where it came from, we acknowledge the original title, we acknowledge the, the, the work of those who came before, but they have built on this. And indeed, when you talk about in terms of engagement and things like that, the digital version of this book um, has got about 500 self-assessment quizzes built into it. And students love it. In fact, the, the only thing when we surveyed um, two semesters worth of students, the one thing they complained about 
was there are not enough review questions. Um, because what you do is as you are reading, and then it will have a knowledge checkpoint. You can go in there, you answer the questions, you click on, on your answers, those kinds of things, and then it provides you with some immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. It lets you know if you've understood the topic. Um, and so they're now working on this. But again, this work would not have been possible if it hadn't already existed. So these are only two examples that kind of scratch the surface of, of what is possible. And I'm going to give you some lists here. Again, come back and take a look through um, the, the lists that I've got here. But there are a range of open education initiative and resources. So there's a whole range here that you can explore. And I did mention the open textbook library earlier. Um, and the other one that I would really draw your attention to is the OER Commons. Now the OER Commons, which is the second one on that list there, is the largest global repository of open material in the world. Um, it has got a staggering amount of content in there. And if you are going to use it, go in and use the advanced search because the advanced search allows you to limit for things by educational level. So if you want it for schools or if you want it for undergraduate students or postgraduate students, and then you can also filter by the type of material you're after. There's a whole range of things. But if you use the advanced search, that would be my recommendation because then you can really save time. Also, um, if you were interested in following up on any of this and you were interested in any professional learning, there are a couple of formal structures, but also um, you'll see under open professional learning, that third one down, Rebus Office Hours. This is a series of presentations that are stored on YouTube. Um, I actually try to go to these live every month when they're, they're available, and they're absolutely fantastic. You can hear from people who are doing a whole range of different things in the field of open education. Um, also, um, there are a bunch of communities which are available. So um, if you wanted to get by with a little help from your friends, a nod to the picture there, um, there are a whole range of groups that you would be able to, uh, to join or at least follow. So if I'm going to leave you only with five ways of looking at open or five ways of conceptualizing open education, we talked about open as freedom. So what can we do when we have access, or at least we make access possible to these kinds of resources that we can't do in closed environments? Open is very student focused. We talk about them educationally, but also we talk about them as the whole of person. That's the reason why I bring in statistics like I did about the students who experience homelessness, those who skip um, those who skip uh, meals, um, those who may not be able to access um, medical uh, facilities and medical services. Normally when you're writing a syllabus, no one asks you who your students are. No one says to you, describe your students, what kinds of challenges are they having? Okay, but when you're looking at open, you do consider those kinds of things. Open is meeting some institutional goals. So have a think, this is something we haven't talked about greatly, but it is something where you can think about how does it fit within the organization in which you teach. Mm -hmm. uh, so for myself, okay, we have a lot of reporting goals around things like retention and progression of students, student engagement, student achievement, employability. And so I have to think about, well, how do I demonstrate value towards those things? Open is also a way of meeting a personal philosophy and ideology. We started the session with people saying, why am I involved in, in education? What am I doing? Uh, why am I here? This is one of the things that can perhaps help you to answer that question or at least align what you're doing at work with your personal philosophy. And also open as a societal good for the community. So how can we transparently build systems where people are able to engage with education with as little, with as little barriers as possible and so what we can do here is when you put all of this together, it is actually a very powerful tool to be able to change not only education, but people's lives. I'm going to leave you with a quote um, from, a, uh, from a recent science fiction series called Picard. And uh, in that, the, the, the main character, when he's uttered these words, I, I paused, I rewound, I wrote them down because I thought it perfectly sums up. The past is written, 
but the future is left for us to write and we have powerful tools. Openness, optimism, and the spirit of curiosity. And I certainly hope that going forward, that this is a way, or at least your studies are a way of you really engaging with openness, optimism, and your spirit of curiosity. And with that, I'll hand back over to Kashmira. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, it was so overwhelming, some of the things, uh, especially those uh, statistics around, uh, you know, students struggle and all that. It really breaks my heart. I mean, nobody um, should have gone through that kind of thing, especially when they are students and trying to study and trying to create their career. But, um, but thank you so much for sharing. So I'll just open up for questions if you have any or, um, yeah. Any questions from any of you? Uh, Nanda said that he is not able to uh, talk for some reason. So um, Nanda, if you want, you can ask uh, in chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, unmute your mic and just ask if you have any questions. How do I uh, get to the Open Textbook Library? <laughs> okay, so the Open Textbook Library, let's go back and if you take a look on that slide there that I'm sharing with you, it is this one here, the open.umn.edu. And that will take you straight through to the Open Textbook Library. And they have a running counter to give you an idea on how big it's grown. When I got involved with them about three years ago, they had 700 texts. Now they've got about 1,100. So they're really, uh, they're, they are really uh, gaining traction. Yeah. And I'll share these slides with you afterwards so that you have all of these links. You can follow them through to your heart's content. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. No problems. So, yeah, once I receive this uh, PowerPoint from uh, Adrian, then I will share with you. As usual, we will, it will all be in the record, with the recording in the online session folder um, on LearnLine. So, yeah. So I'll just stop recording if there is no questions. What we do, Colin, you have any questions? Joy? No? Nandu? But I, I did want to thank everybody for, for being such a such a great and engaged audience. And I'm always really appreciated at your uh, appreciate your generosity because when I ask questions and people actually engage, that is that's a form of generosity. And I'm always very pleased when people share that. So I just wanted to make sure that you you knew that um, that was the case. Um, and one last thing that you might also um, like to consider is that there are even um, even things like all the images that I used in tonight's presentation. They were all either openly licensed or in the public domain. And on this last slide, you can see that I, I make reference to a site called Pixabay. Um, so if you're ever looking for pictures to go with, uh, with you know, whether it be lecture slides, whether it be activities, whatever else, go into Pixabay and take a look through the material in there. Um, and a lot of it is really high quality stuff. I mean, you saw the types of images that were embedded through my slides. Every single one of those, someone has made, photographed, and then decided to share with the world. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And uh, uh, I didn't probably, is anybody asking a question? No. So as I mentioned in the last year as well, Adrian, that um, we also have in the learn line, uh, we also have a copyright declaration that any of the material or anything that is in the course um, is shareable and open for everyone to copy because I was able to say it because uh, last year I read out uh, the whole unit and that all belongs to me. So I can tell everyone to just copy, take, do whatever they want. So. I'm very happy about that. So you're already living these values. That's great. Yeah. But uh, the other thing is that uh, there's kind of like a, a, a bit of an issue because once you have the uh, user ID and password to get into LearnLine, then it's free and then you can take it. 
But what if, if you don't have that, you know? So that is another uh, limitations, but um, I'm not sure how I can just, you know, get that material out of LearnLine and uh, share it with everyone, but yeah. Well, one of the one of the ways that you could consider, and it's not always um, the the best tool, so it's really to decide whether it fits your context. Something that we spoke a lot about in the last hour. Um, one of these uh, on one of the slides that I shared there was the OER Commons, which yeah. is the uh, I said the largest repository of open content. Um, I actually. Um, I actually really encourage people to share their content there uh, because that is where other open practitioners go to look. Um, rather than uh, I, a lot of universities that I've dealt with, they will say, oh, we're thinking of building a repository for all of our open material. And I said, don't, just don't. Uh, one, they're incredibly costly and you've got to, and plus you prov you're giving another space for people to look, you're just confusing people. Why don't you put all your content in something that already exists? Yeah. Go where people already look. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, to me, that argument is fairly common sense. Yeah, yeah, obviously. And, and you gave me a great idea that uh, I, I do photography as well just for my hobby and I, I have lots of great, great photographs. So you gave me an idea where to put it and so fix it. And I can, and I can see Colleen, yes. Has a question, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, cause um, I'm new at this and every time I'm, mm -hmm. when I'm studying, I'm mainly, my search engine is mainly Google, because um, it's part of the Department of Education. But yes. I've yeah, never heard of Pixabay and OER Commons. So when I'm researching, so that could also be a place that I could look, Pixabay and OER. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, they, so when you're saying OER Commons is, so has that got more content than Google or is it that the same? No, it's what more it's... Like to do with education? It's focused purely on educational materials. Okay. That's all that's yeah. in the OER Commons. Yeah. Um, so you won't get all of the rest of the material. You'll only get education focused materials. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Because I. Oh, my pleasure. To. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, there are uh, so if you go into LearnLine and there is a. Uh, a document with lots of links and that is just after the online session uh, folder where I have added lots of links uh, to different things and in there there is a, a creative commons music and uh, uh, there are other uh, creative commons resources as well so if you go through those uh, you will find those as well because I, I do a lot of like, a, a, you know, uh, when I do a photography of some particular place, I, I do a little video of that. And I put little kind of like small music behind it just to make it more interesting. And that's how I came to know about that uh, uh, Creative Common Music Library. It has lots of tunes and like it, it keeps adding all the time when you see it. So there are lots of resources there as well. So just have a look at that uh, document as well. So first thing tomorrow morning, uh, Kashmira, when I get into work, I'll send you a copy of um, the slides and then sure. please do feel free. The other thing, everyone, is that um, my details are on the very first slide. And so if you did want to talk about um, open any further or if you did have any questions um, about open education, I don't mind at all if you do get in contact with me. As you can probably tell, I get a bit excited about this topic and you know, I could talk all day. Um, so much to the horror of my colleagues. Uh, but um, if you do have any questions or any follow up, please do feel free to reach out. I'd be more than happy to help. Sure. And also, you know, uh, you can go to Ask Elight and join uh, the Open Education uh, Special Interest Group as well, because they have regular webinars and different activities that you can attend as well as a teacher for ongoing professional development. And you can go uh, join my special interest group as well. I'm not promoting, but you know, you can just, because as a teacher, it, it's good for you to uh, have different perspective on different things. And uh, uh, given that after chat, chat GP, uh, GPT, 
it's just so much uh, discussion and on AI and all that, and we will have some uh, very good speakers around it as well. So yeah. Okay, so I'll just stop recording. Thank you very much, everyone, Nadia, especially to you. My pleasure.